1 Chronicles chapter 18. And the first lesson we want in this is, one, God is going to be glorified. And in that lesson, here's another lesson in it, is that when God is glorified, those who are following Him are also glorified. And on the opposite side of that, when God is glorified, those who are His enemy are put to shame. Now, there is, in this, we're going to be speaking of, if I have calculated it right, uh, five kings that are involved in this. The first one is going to be David. David is the greatest king outside of Christ, the greatest king Israel ever had, and I would also say probably ever for any king. David was probably the best bar none, other than Christ himself. And we see where David is time and time again through Scripture, especially when, when uh, describing various reigns of kings, he is brought in as the good example of this particular king did, did like his father David, or this particular king did wickedly and did not do like his father David. And also, on the opposite side of that, you have Jeroboam, who is used as a very wicked king, a disobedient king, and not only did, is it said that he caused Israel to sin, but those wicked kings in Israel, he was like his father Jeroboam, or like King Jeroboam. Now, in 1 Chronicles chapter 18, we'll begin in verse 3, and God is giving David victory after victory after victory after victory. And he's going against a lot of powerful forces. A lot. And he's going against this in, who must have been an incredibly wealthy king. He must have been. But we begin in verse 3. So 1 Chronicles 18, verse 3. And David de uh, defeated Hadazedar, king of Zobah, as far as Hamath, as he went to establish his power by the river Euphrates. So this, we don't know much about Hadazedar, or Hadadezer, sorry, Hadadezer. We don't know much about him, but he had to have had a lot of wealth. He's trying to establish his power, and David comes and he defeats him. Now notice, David took from him 1,000 chariots, 7,000 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers. Also David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. So it looks like there is this, and it is, this massive defeat and well victory for David but defeat for for this Hadadezer this massive de defeat and he has uh, now 20,000 foot soldiers he didn't kill them he captured them and also 7,000 horsemen he didn't he didn't kill them he captured them verse 5 when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer king of Zobah David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. So the Lord preserved David wherever he went. God is glorified in these victories, and David, who's following God, is also glorified. David follows God, and God brings him these victories. And there is going to be this very powerful kingdom there because God is behind it. And that kingdom is Israel. And David is, is the, the king at that time. And David is faithful to God. Not throughout his entire life. He did make massive mistakes, but he always came back. He came back to God. Now, we see this, verse 7. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. 
So here, this particular king, this king of Zobah, had officers who had shields of gold. Now that's impressive. And this would, this would be a, a precious thing to be taking into battle. But evidently they did. Evidently they, they did. And, and by the way, that would be a, a very heavy object. It, it, if, it, if it's solid gold, that would be a very heavy shield. But they had them, and it's enough to where David is going to take them away. And when you're, when you're willing to do something like that, you've got a lot of gold. Okay. When you're, when you're willing to do something like that. But here, we're going to come across what could be called a horde. A horde is a massive collection of something. And in archaeology, there, there are various things that can be called a horde. It's suddenly they, they find like this uh, uh, burial site. And there's all, suddenly they've discovered all these things from some ancient past, okay? And every now and then, and I, I actually saw one of these, it was a, uh, someone in the Roman Empire buried a sack of coins. Obviously, they never retrieved them. They must have died or something, never found them, I don't know. But thousands of years, well, a couple of thousand years anyway, later, it's discovered. Or somebody's digging around and they, they discover it, and, and quite a discovery too. It's quite, and that, that's called a hoard. But what we're about to see is far greater than that. This is where, where this king of, of Zorba got these things, I don't know. But he had to have a lot of wealth to do it. But we look, verse 7, I'm sorry, verse 8. Also, from Tibhath and from Chun, cities of Hadadezer, David brought a large amount of bronze, with which Solomon made the bronze sea, the pillars, and the articles of bronze. Now, that's going to be years from now. So, the writer of 1 Chronicles is obviously already knows about what Solomon did. This, this would have been well after the fact. But here we have the history of that bronze, at least to this point, of where it's from this conquest that David finds this bronze. And here, this is going to be part of what's going into the bronze sea, the pillars, and the articles of bronze. And it's a lot. It, it is, in fact, a tremendous amount. Now then, uh, Tuo, or To, how, To, I guess, I don't know, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the arm of, army of Hadadezer, king of Gezobah. He sent uh, Hador, Hadoram, his son, to King David to greet him and bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him. For Hadadezer had been at war with Tau, and uh, Hadoram brought with him all kinds of articles of gold, silver, and bronze. So here's more bronze on top of what he had. Here's more in that. Now, we go to chapter 22. First Chronicles chapter 22, beginning in verse 2. David is going to use this. Now, the writer of Chronicles already knew what the, where that bronze was going to be. Even when David may not have known. David may not have known how he was going to use that, but bronze in that age was highly useful. Bronze in this age is useful, but bronze in that age was extremely useful because that is where you're going to get your armor, that's where you're going to get your swords, unless you can really spend the money and get iron. But it's a, a lot of stuff that, can be, that this can be made into, but it's not going to be made into implements of war. It's going to be made into matters of the temple. Some of them large things. Some of them numerous things. So, 1 Chronicles 22, verse 2, So David commanded together the aliens who were in the land of Israel, and he appointed masons to cut hewn stones to build the house of God. Now, David's not allowed to build the house. But he can start it. He can gather everything up, including starting on the stones. 
Now, he cannot build it, but he's not going to. But he's going to begin gathering it up. And while he, gather, he amasses a lot of stuff, Solomon also is going to in his day. But he's, he's gathering it up. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails of the doors of the gates and for the joints and bronze in abundance beyond measure. So this is beyond measure. Nobody knows how much it is. Nobody. It's just a lot. And that's going to be the case through the, everything we hear about this bronze, is that it's an awful lot. And here we have God is allowing David, allowing David to plan out that temple. And God is not displeased with it. And it's okay. He's allowed to plan it out. He's allowed to get materials together. He's just not allowed to build it, and so he's not. He's not going to build it. And here's a thing concerning David, and this would be another, another little lesson in all this, is David saw a future for Israel even when he wasn't going to be in it. All right, with some folks, with some folks, you know, they, they see, well, I live so long and I'm going to die, I don't care what happens after that. I, what do I care? I, I, I don't care what happens beyond that. I'm not going to be here. But others see a future and want the best for the, the next king who he knows is going to be Solomon. That's already been determined. All right. He didn't determine that Solomon was going to be the next king on his deathbed. That had already been done. And uh, that had already been determined. Solomon isn't even close to being the, David's firstborn. Not even close. Uh, you've got uh, quite a line up there before you get to Solomon, but it is Solomon who is chosen, and God is behind that. Now, here, David is willing to do all of this, and we just continue on. Verse 4, And cedar trees in abundance for the Sidonians and those from Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. So here in this golden age, we can call it that, in this truly golden age, Israel is faithful to God. Yes, there are those living in that day who would have been unfaithful. There would have been those who would have despised someone like David, like his son, Absalom. There would have been those that would not have, have appreciated uh, David's emphasis on preparing for the temple, those things could be used for something else. I'm quite sure of it. But at this point, you've got a very righteous king, and God is blessing that nation greatly. Now, we go to 2 Chronicles chapter 4. 2 Chronicles chapter 4. And we see where Solomon is beginning to build the furnishings for the temple. David, at this, David has died. Solomon is now king. And building that temple is now first priority for him. He, he begins this in earnest. And it is an extraordinary building. It's not huge, as one might uh, think of extraordinary buildings. It's not the biggest structure of its day. It wasn't, but it would have been very impressive. And the gold, in the the, uh, the the bronze that we're looking at this evening, and the the basic art, artistry and architecture of it, it would have been extraordinary. And because Jerusalem is on a mountain, it could have been seen for many miles away that temple could be seen. And we're, though we're not going to read uh, concerning uh, the dedication of it, that you could have had Gentiles miles away see and hear what was going on around that temple and the power of God being displayed there. And it would have been frightening. Especially... If you uh, 
uh, thought that somehow the, the gods of your homeland were superior. You've never seen that before. Fire coming out of heaven, you've never seen that before. But chapter 4, so 2 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 3. Moreover, he made bronze, a bronze altar. Look at this. 20 cubits was its length. 20 cubits, that's 30 feet. 20 cubits, its width. That's 30 foot square, 30 by 30. And 10 cubits, its height, that's 15 feet. That's a big object. Now, yeah, it's hollow because it's, a, it's a, an altar. But this is a very large object. Now we come to this, uh, verse 2. Then he made the sea of cast bronze. 10 cubits. Now, I have made mention of this before, and I just want to make mention of it here. Many, many years after this ancient world, there was a man, you might know him by name. His name was Leonardo da Vinci. Renaissance Italy. He wanted to make a large statue out of bronze. But he understood that you can't make something massive, cast bronze, you can't make something massive out of all that bronze with, uh, with it, uh, un unless it's done in one fell swoop. It's got to be done in one pour. It's got to be. Otherwise, you've got a problem with it. It's got to be done in one Pour, which means you have to have a massive furnace that can melt that much bronze and keep it thoroughly melted for the pour. He never made that, that, uh, that statue. He never made it because he couldn't. He, he knew what had to be done, but he could not build that furnace, probably because it was going to cost way, way too much and no one was willing to, to do that for him. No one was, was willing to, to do it. But he knew there was limitations when it came to pouring out bronze in to, to, make, to make statues or, or large objects. He knew that. Now what we're looking at here are huge objects that are in fact molded. These are cast, this is from cast bronze. So what was happening here in Solomon's day is what Leonardo da Vinci wanted to do but couldn't do. They are making very large, thick objects. And they're capable of doing it. And of course, Solomon has employed the experts of the age to do it. That's what he has done. But let's, let's continue on. Verse 2, Then he made the sea of cast bronze ten cubits from, from one brim to the other. Now understand that while the, the sea is circular, it's not a, it's never intended to be a perfect circle. It's never intended to be. It is artistically done. Okay, so I saw this preposterous argument from someone saying that, that it, it's from a skeptic saying that the, the Bible is so off in, in, in talking about this, this uh, sea and that it's not even making a perfect circle. Well, it never said it was making a perfect circle. It never did. This is artistic. It's not trying to make something per perfectly circular. It's of a different shape entirely. All right, so it's 10 cubits from one brim to the other. That's 15 feet across. It was completely round, all right? Round is different from making a perfect circle. Its height was five cubits, so that's seven and a half feet, and a line of 30 cubits measured its circumference. So if you, you had a line going around it, it would be 45 feet all the way around. This is a large object, but we're not through with it yet. And under it was the likeness of oxen encircling it all around, 10 to a cubit, all the way around the sea. The oxen were cast in two rows when it was cast. So it's actually part of the sea. 
It stood on the twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, three looking toward the east. The sea was set upon them and on their back part, and, and all their back parts pointed inward. So they're all facing outward. All this is made out of bronze. It's a lot. So this is all, as we have, as we have already made mention, this is all going to the temple. This is all going there. And it's a continuation of this massive amount of wealth, which really is what it is. You have this, you've got a lot of wealth. Massive amount of wealth going to glorify God. God, is He pleased with it? Yeah, He's not unpleased. Can He, or displeased, can He be worshipped without these things? Well, He had been for centuries. And He never asked for a temple, but He allows it to be done. But in this golden age, this is what they're doing, and He allows for it to happen. He does. And now we need to continue in all this that God is behind them. And once again, when God is glorified, which they want to do, they're actively trying to do that, then those who are obedient to God will be glorified as well. Glorified as well. You become His enemy, God's still going to be glorified. But you, but you become His enemy, you will be put to shame. Now let's go to verse 16. So we're still in 2 Chronicles chapter 4. Uh, four. We go to verse 16. Also the pots, here's more, the pots, the shovels, the forks, and all the articles, Huram, his master craftsman, made of burnished bronze for King Solomon for the house of the Lord. This is not just minor things, and it's a lot. And this is all from burnished bronze. These would be beautiful objects. Very beautiful. In the plain of Jordan, the king had them cast in clay molds between Succoth and Zerida. And Solomon had all these articles made in such great abundance that the weight of the bronze was not determined. There's a lot of stuff. He's making it. Don't even know how much it is. But they're just, they just keep producing, keep producing. That's what Solomon wants. Just keep producing it. And it's all burnished bronze. Beautiful things. Now, we go to chapter 7, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, beginning in verse 19. And this is God's second appearing to Solomon. First time he appeared to Solomon, he says, ask of me and I'll give it. And what does Solomon say? He says, how can I know how to judge this people? And he wants wisdom. He wants to be able to judge righteously. All right, this is the second time. And this is at the dedication of the temple that this occurs. And here, beginning in verse 19, here is a warning. But it's a warning that's not new. It's a warning that Israel would have received from Moses. Several times from Moses. And then from others as well. Verse 19, but if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them. He's talking about Israel. And this house, which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. Now, that would have been a very important thing to know and recognize in the days of Jeremiah. Because that's what Jeremiah was saying. And that's also what Ezekiel had been saying. But Jeremiah before him. That God is not going to have His house polluted and perverted. He's not. He'd rather it just be leveled than for that to happen. He, he's not going to put up with verse 21. And as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done this to this land and this house? Then they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore He has brought all this calamity to Him. All of the beauty that could be seen in that finished and new temple 
And in the dedication of this temple, God is telling him, disobey me, and this temple means nothing. It is valueless. And that is a lesson that needs to be learned today, is that God wants faithfulness above anything else. He wants us to love Him above anything else. And to take His word and as one, as, as, and we can see it in, in uh, the history of Israel and also with, with someone like Solomon, of this extraordinary blessings that have been given by God are now going to, in a little bit of time, a matter of a few years, are going to be used for someone else. They're going to be used for Baal. They're going to be used for various other <laughs> man-made things. And Israel is going to begin worshiping them. Israel is going to do it. Now, we come to, let's go to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 25. And we begin in verse 3. 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 3. This is quite a distance in time. We've gone through a, a split kingdom. Israel is the northern kingdom. Judah is the southern kingdom. Uh, we've had um, Israel has fallen by way of the Assyrians. And now the southern kingdom by way of the Babylonians. And now we see where Nebuchadnezzar has had enough of them. Uh, we were explaining it just this morning in our class on the book of Daniel. That Nebuchadnezzar, when he comes in the first time, he doesn't destroy the temple. He takes articles out of it, but he doesn't, he doesn't destroy it. But he comes back later, and there's, there's with rebellious kings, he's got to come back. And with these rebellious kings, he, he hammers a little harder. And here he hammers down hard, and he's going to destroy the temple. He's going to destroy it. And someone like Jeremiah is actually going to witness it. Jeremiah is actually going to describe some things. But let's, let's look at this. Verse 3, so 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 3. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. So you have uh, uh, the Babylonian army around. They've encamped against Jerusalem. No food's going in. No supplies are going in. And eventually the food runs out. So there's a famine. Verse 4, Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled at night by way of the gate between two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans still encamped all around against the city, and the king went by way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook him in the plain of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they pronounced judgment on him. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah, that is the king, before his eyes, put out his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great. He burned with fire, and all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around, and Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city, and the defectors who had deserted the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. But the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers, Verse 13, the bronze pillars that were, that were in the house of the Lord and the carts, we haven't mentioned them. Those are, we didn't read about them, but it, these are also recorded as well. Those are also from that bronze. And the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried their bronze to Babylon. 
They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils with which the priests ministered, the fire pans and the basins, the things of solid gold and solid silver, the captain of the guard took away, the two pillars, one sea, and the carts which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all the articles was beyond measure. It's, it's only gotten bigger since, since uh, uh, David captured the first part it's only been amassed more, and these are all the things that have been stored there for a long, long time. They had been there, but now God is going to be glorified. And we keep saying that, so what does it mean this go around? What does it mean by this? That if He told Solomon, and Solomon's not the only one He told, but if He told Solomon, if this nation goes away from Me, I'll take away this house. Even on the day that it was being dedicated, God could say those words. I'll take away this house because it's meaningless to him. If he had wanted that temple from the beginning, he would have ordered it. But what he actually ordered, and we have the, all the details concerning it, was that tabernacle. That's what he called for. Now he allows for, for all this and he's okay with this. But if they're going to be disobedient, God is not mocked. And it would be a mockery to think that, okay, let's just say we're the people of Jerusalem, that we can behave however we want. We've got that temple. He's not going to do anything to us because it would mean the destruction of that temple. We're protecting that temple Therefore, He's going to protect us. That was a mentality. And that is flawed. That is not the way God works. God is not going to be mocked and God is not going to be uh, someone that, uh, uh, that you're going to be able to hold and force to do something, to protect something that He's not going to protect. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 52. Jeremiah 52, Jeremiah witnesses this, as a matter of fact. And we'll begin in verse 17. Jeremiah sees this, and verse 17, he says this, he writes this, The bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord, and the carts of the, and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all their bronze to Babylon. It's broken into pieces. All right, exactly how that's done. Well, I've never really broken bronze, so I can't tell you how it's done. It's just that they did it. And matter of fact, he's going to describe something that has never been described. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the bowls, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils with which the priests ministered, the basins, the fire pans, the bowls, the pots, the lampstands, the spoons, and the cups, whatever was solid gold and whatever was solid silver, the captains of the guard took away the two pillars, one see the twelve bronze bulls which were under it, and the carts which King Solomon had made for the house of the Lord. That goes back many, many years. The bronze and all the articles were beyond measure. Now concerning the pillars, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits. A measuring line of 12 cubits could measure the circumference, and its thickness was four fingers. It was hollow. Now we didn't know that before. We didn't know that they were hollow, but that pillar is 27 feet tall. Its circumference is, if you put a line around it, is 18 feet. That's quite a massive column. That's big. That is very, very big. And when I was talking about what Leonardo da Vinci was, was trying to do, this is much larger than anything he ever did or that age could ever do. But here they were doing it in a much more ancient time. And now from all this, God brings victory and protection to those who follow Him and He is very serious. How many times must we as humanity be taught? How many times must we be taught? If you leave faithfulness 
to God, He leaves you and it matters. Sometimes we can be guilty of not really remembering God until things get very, very bad and then suddenly we remember Him. All right, that's a bad habit to be in. Matter of fact, I would say that's extremely bad and I would not really call it a habit. I'd call that more of a rut or a pit. You need to get out of that. I need to get out of that as well. And, and avoid that to remember God at all times. God will be honored. He'll never be mocked. You're not going to allow for it. What He says will be done. And in following Him, He, as Jesus stated, will be with us even to the end of the age. He'll be with us. Christ has given that assurance. But if we're not with Him, He's going to give us up. God's done it to those in the past. He's doing it to, the, to the people here in the present, and He'll do it to us as well. But if we're faithful, He will remain faithful to us exactly as He stated. This evening... Judgment will be done when it arrives. There's no knowing that. Jesus described it as Him coming as a thief in the night. You don't know when that is. There is no sign for that. There's no red flags. There's nothing. All that we can know is as time passes, we're getting closer to that day. We're getting closer to it. We see where someone like Paul did not know when that would be. Because in writing to the Corinthians, he was talking about if, if Christ were to come and they were still alive, which he saw as a possibility. Not only that, but Jesus, while on this earth at least, I can't answer now, while on this earth, he did not know when it would be. That information was not given to him. And it's not given to him. And who, who, who are any of us to say we figured it out when the Son of God didn't, did not know? And I'm going to take his word at it that he, he didn't know. It wasn't given to him. But having all authority, now he probably does know. One way or another, he returns. One way or another, we're going to be standing in front of the judge. One way or another... His will is going to be done and justice is going to be done. And He's not going to have a loyal to us, loyalty to us if we have no loyalty to Him. If you need to respond to the invitation, if we can help you in any way, we ask that you come as we stand and sing.